reach our world. We want to reach these lost and dying souls, God, with your message, with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah, for it is the power of God unto salvation. To the Jew first and also to the Greek. To everyone that believes. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise God. Praise God. Amen. Amen. You may be seated for a moment. Amen. Greetings from Coweta, Oklahoma. Amen. It was about ten and a half years ago. I was praying in what would end up being the living room of our house. We had signed the papers for the house to be built and didn't even have the loan approved yet. We had a lot of obstacles and a lot of needs and really we needed a miracle. But by faith, we just trusted that God was going to help us get this house. And I remember praying in the living room, which was the concrete floor and some wooden two-by-fours around it. It was still an open house. <laughs> and I was asking God if it was His will to give us this house. And unexpectedly, the Lord spoke to me and said, I want you to start a church in Coweta. And I said, okay, um, Lord, if you'll give me this house. <laughs> I was bargaining. I said, Lord, if you give me this house, I'll, I'll use it for your glory, whatever you want me to do. And I believe in the timing of God, that it is just as important as the will of God. I didn't expect it to take so long, but eight years later, after we got the house... I went to my pastor and I said, it's time. I'd already talked to him about my burden to start a church in Coweta. And I said, I feel like it's, the time is now. He gave me some metal chairs and a music stand for a podium. And he said, have at it. And we started having church in our living room. Within just a few weeks, we were running over 20 people in our church in our living room. It was exciting. And we grew so quick that we went beyond preaching point status for home missions. We were already home mission church status. The district was getting wind of it and they were excited for us. And, uh, and we still run a pretty good group. But as my wife said, when you do a work for the Lord, the devil fights. And we had one thing after another, after another, after another, after another. I was sick for three months. Uh, our dog got stolen out of our backyard by our neighbor two houses down. And I could talk a long time about that individual that I prayed for. Because if I didn't pray for him, I was going to lose my Holy Ghost. I could tell you some things he did that just tried my Holy Ghost. Um, and I don't even have time for that. But there was just a, a one thing after another. There was a word from the Lord that came to me when I was 18 years old. I was at senior camp, and the Lord called me to pastor a church, 18 years old. That didn't get officially fulfilled until I was 46 years old. I never expected it to take that long. But I must have had a lot to learn, because <laughs> I know I did. But 18 years old, God spoke to me a word about how it was going to happen. The first two years of my pastoring. He told me that the first year was going to be a trying year for me. He told me that it was going to be some issues and some of the issues he spoke to me about were very specific it didn't make sense to me at the time and I didn't understand why all the detail why not just speak to me and tell me I want you to pastor but in God's mercy and his grace he knew that I needed this word because he told me the second year is going to be a year of great revival of miracles of adding to the church 
and there would be awesome things happening. I didn't realize it, but God gave me that word to encourage me to hang on in that first year. Because honestly, if I had not had that word from the Lord, there were many times in my humanity I could have just said, this isn't worth it. There's so many things happening to us. Financial uh, issues and family issues and saint issues. And we lost a couple and then we lost those three young people. I'm thankful today to tell you that they are back in the church. That they are living for God. The couple that the devil took out have been coming back to church. Amen. So God has a way of fixing things. We started this church the first year and we had tremendous revival. And I didn't think about that word of the Lord until that next January when in the business meeting the church officially voted me in as pastor. And all of a sudden, that word of the Lord came to my mind. And I said, uh-oh. And that's no joke. From that time on, and even before that time, we had, I, literally, I, I, my wife wrote a list. It's, it's so long of so many horrible things that happened to us. And so, we are now in our second year. <laughs> Thank you, Jesus. And we are already having some great things happen. Uh, we are supposed to be officially autonomous by March of next year. Could be as early as January. And um, we are uh, going to be a home missions church officially. But please pray for Coweta, Oklahoma. Pray for us. We are expecting a mighty move of the Spirit. I've... I shared that word. Me and my wife are the only ones that knew that word. I shared it with the church. And so they're expecting great things because they know what their pastor and pastor's wife have been through. Amen. Let's stand. I know we've taken a lot of time. And I know it's, our, it's so good to be an apostolic lighthouse. What a beautiful facility this is. Wonderful. And like Brother Scott said, God's got this. This is God's church. He knows how to take care of the needs. He knows how to move the obstacles out of the way. Because God wants a church in this city even more than you do. God wants to save people even more than you want to save them. God wants to fill people with the Holy Ghost even more than we want to see them filled with the Holy Ghost. And He's going to make it happen. Yes. In Jesus' name. Daniel eleven thirty two. I have a Sunday night type of a message. But I feel a Sunday night type of an atmosphere in this place tonight. The mark of a good church is when you come in on a Wednesday night when people have worked all day, it's the middle of the week, and they're tired, and you feel that precious anointing and power of the Holy Ghost. And that's what we have felt here tonight. Nothing better than a church that can have Sunday night service on a Wednesday night. And Sunday morning when they're sleepy and they got out of bed, but the bed hadn't got out of them, and they still worship God, and the Holy Ghost moves. Amen. I am a product of a Wednesday night Bible study service. I got the Holy Ghost on a Wednesday night Bible study service. People can get the Holy Ghost on Wednesday night, on Sunday morning, on Sunday night. Because our God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He doesn't change. He doesn't get tired. He doesn't get wore out. He still pours out the Holy Ghost every day of the week. Amen. But I do know that some of you have worked today. And so I won't preach long because I understand. I'm on vacation. So I feel pretty rested. Although I did go to Disneyland and Disney's California Adventure and to the beach. And I have walked until my calves are so sore. But when I was jumping up and down <laughs> earlier, they felt pretty good. Amen. So we've got our exercise. 
But anyways, I got I to stop meddling and get into the Word. Let's go to Daniel 11, 32. I don't have my paper Bible because I didn't want American Airlines to charge me for another bag because it's so heavy. I said, I'll just pack my <clears throat> electronic Bible. <laughs> and so I'm using my phone as my word tonight. I hope that doesn't offend you, but I'm going to read the scripture right off of this here. It says, and such as do wickedly against the covenant shall he corrupt by flatteries. But the people that do know their God, people that know their God shall be strong and do exploits. In order to have exploits, you have to know Jesus Christ, really know Him. And I want to go to Acts chapter 3, verse 1. And thank God for large print on these phones, because I'm getting old. And it's lit up for me too. I have it on here. But I have, my glasses are in the car. So now Peter and John, I just, I'm going to get focused, I promise. Now Peter and John went up together into the temple at the hour of prayer, being the ninth hour. And a certain man, lame from his mother's womb, was carried, whom they laid daily at the gate of the temple, which is called Beautiful, to ask alms of them that entered into the temple. Who seeing Peter and John about to go into the temple, asked an alms. And Peter fastening his eyes upon him with John, said, look on us. And he gave heed unto them, expecting to receive something of them. Then Peter said, silver and gold have I none, but such as I have give I thee. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And he took him by the right hand and lifted him up. And immediately his feet and ankle bones received strength. And he leaping up stood and walked and entered with them into the temple. Walking and leaping and Praising God. Hallelujah. Praise God. I want to focus on those three words that I read just a moment ago. Look on us. Look on us. You may be seated. Amen. This passage of Scripture is one of the most preached on passages in the Scripture that I, can, that I know. I've been in the church over 32 years. And I have heard preachers preach from this setting over and over and over again. And one day when I was reading my Bible, I read this passage of Scripture. And I know this story very well as I trust many of you know very well. And as I was reading this passage, those three words jumped off the page as he said, look on us. Look on us. Now before I get to my main point, let me just talk about a few things along the way. First of all, Peter and John were on their way to prayer. They had not prayed yet. They had not made it to the prayer room. They were on their way to to prayer. I believe we can walk with God in such a way that we don't have to hit the prayer room before we can see a miracle from the Lord Jesus Christ. When you know Him, you are going to do exploits. When you pray consistently, you don't have to wait to get to church to have a miracle happen in your life. They were on their way to church. They were on their way to prayer. And God performed a miracle. Because they already had it on the inside. They were just going to prayer to renew some more. They already were full of the Holy Ghost. I believe we can walk in the Spirit in such a way that we don't have to wait till Sunday to pray somebody through to the Holy Ghost. That we can pray a co-worker through to the Holy Ghost. 
that we can pray a classmate through to the Holy Ghost, a neighbor through to the Holy Ghost. We don't have to wait till they come to church. My wife taught a Bible study to a lady that I reached on the bus while I was at work driving a transit bus. She taught her a Bible study in her apartment, laid hands on her, and God filled her with the Holy Ghost right there in her apartment. My wife could have said, let's wait until we get to the church on Sunday. But no, she said, no, let's pray right now. And she put her hands on her and she began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit of God gave the utterance. When you walk with Him, you don't have to wait to get to church. Now, I'm not saying don't go to church. Peter and John were going to church. So you make sure you go. But remember when you go, you've already got what you need living inside. They realized what they got at Pentecost. Peter and John knew what they had. Acts 1 and 8 says, For you shall receive power. After that the Holy Ghost is come upon you. And you shall be witnesses unto me. Both in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria. And even to the uttermost parts of Barstow, California. I know I changed a little bit there. That's a long ways off though. I'll tell you from Jerusalem. <laughs> We're a long ways. <laughs> but even to the uttermost parts of the earth. We have power. That word power comes from the Greek word dunamis. It is where we get our English word dynamite. It is supernatural power, ability, and strength from God. If you've got the Holy Ghost tonight, you've got everything you need to pray for the sick, to see a miracle, to raise the dead. Jesus said, greater things shall ye do than I've done. And that power is living inside of you. Amen. And Peter and John recognized what they had. When they went to the, the beggar and they saw that he was begging for money, the beggar said, alms, alms, I need money. And they said, we don't got any. Silver and gold we don't have. But I know what I do got. <laughs> They knew what they got on the day of Pentecost when they were filled with the Holy Ghost and spoke with other tongues. They received the power to see people healed. And so, I'm getting ahead of myself. Let me read Acts 1 and 4. And being assembled together with them, commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father, which saith he, you have heard of me. They recognized that they had received the promise of the Holy Ghost. Mark 16 and 17 says, And these signs shall follow them that believe. In my name they shall cast out devils. They shall speak with new tongues. They shall take up serpents. And if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. They shall lay hands on the sick. And they shall recover. I don't know if that message from the Lord was going through their mind as they approached that beautiful gate where the beggar was begging. But they knew that what the Lord said, that I'm going to be able to lay hands on the sick and they're going to recover. And so when they said, silver and gold have I none, but such as I have, I'm going to give it to you. The first thing about this miracle is that they recognized what they had. What they had. In verse 2 of my text, I'm going slow because I want you to get some of this before I really take off. And a certain man lame from his mother's room was carried, whom they laid daily, every day, at the gate of the temple. Every day. Every day. 
to ask alms of them that entered into the temple. So every day he was there. And I like this verse 3, who seeing Peter and John was about to go into the temple, asked alms, and Peter fastening his eyes upon him with John said, look on us. They fastened their eyes upon the beggar, the lame man. If we're going to reach our world, we've got to first understand what we have. And then we've got to fasten our eyes upon the world that is hurting all around us. We've got to focus on their needs. We can't just pass them by on their way to church. The lame man represents the world that is hurting, that is lost and dying. And daily we pass by people that are lame spiritually and we're on our way to church. Just like Peter and John on their way to pray, on their way to church. No doubt they had probably passed by him before, but some. For, for some reason this day, they recognize, hey, we've got the power to see this man healed. And they fastened their eyes on him. They looked at him. Hey, I know the world is not a pleasant place. Sometimes sinners can look pretty rough and pretty ugly. But you got to fasten your eyes upon them and understand that they need God. They need a miracle. They need deliverance. They need healing. you got to fasten your eyes. And so they fastened their eyes and they said, look on us. I don't know if there was a special glow on their face, but I believe the Holy Ghost was moving in such a way on Peter and John that when that beggar, that lame man looked up, I believe he saw something. Something different. There's something different about you. When people look on us, they should see something different about us than anybody else in this world. Different than the so-called Christians. Different than people that talk the talk but don't walk the walk. When they look at us, they need to see God living inside of us. When they, when they look at me, I don't want them to see me. I want them to see Jesus. And I believe when Peter and John said, look on us, he looked up and saw something different. He, because the Bible says he expected to receive something. When the world sees something different about you, they expect to receive something. They don't even know what it is, but they're looking with expectancy. When this high desert, when this bar, city of Barstow looks at apostolic lighthouse, they need to see Jesus. They need to see something different. Hallelujah. Amen. And so we need to be aware of the souls that are all around us. Whether it be on the job, whether it be in the school, whether it be in the grocery store, at the bank, or in the restaurant. Wherever we are, whatever we're doing, we have to be aware. Because I don't want to go to the bank and the grocery store and go through my life all week long on my way to church and pass up the lame man on my way to church. Amen. We go to church on Sunday. We go to church on Wednesday. And I don't want to pass up the people that are hurting, the people that need the miracle, the people that need Jesus on my way to church. We go by them daily sometimes. God, give us a spiritual awareness. Amen. And they could have just passed them by again. They could have. But they fastened their eyes. And they said, look at, it. Look at us. <laughs> this is the kind of church that you can be proud of. When you can say, look at Apostolic Lighthouse. Man, we have church. This is a great church. 
When you say, look at us, look at Apostolic Lighthouse, you have to recognize, and I believe you already do, that you have something that nobody else has. You have an anointing. You have a power. You have the power of the Holy Ghost. And you have what it takes to pull somebody out of the pit. Amen. So, the second thing that, the, that Peter and John recognized. First, they recognized what they had. The second thing is they recognized who they were. When they said, look on us, they were saying, hey, look at a Holy Ghost filled child of God. Look at us. The second thing is we've got to remember who we are. We are children of the King. We are the ones that Jesus said, if you believe in my name, you shall cast out devils. In my name, you shall lay hands on the sick and, you, and they shall recover. We forget sometimes who we are. You know, we have the revelation of who God is. We know that God came in the flesh, was manifest in the flesh. We know that Jesus was the visible representation of the invisible God. We have the revelation of one God. We know who He is. But sometimes we forget who we are. When we walk into this city, the devils tremble. Because lying in us is the power of Jesus Christ. When I go to my job, I don't care how much they're cussing. I don't care how much they're telling dirty jokes. When I walk into the room, the devils get afraid because my daddy is bigger than their daddy. And my daddy is living inside of me. The atmosphere changes when I get in the room. Not because of me, but because of Jesus Christ in me. You need to walk through this city like you own this city. You are the children of the Most High God. God has given you this city. He's just waiting on you to come out there and take it. I lived for God in, in school. And they knew that I wasn't ashamed. And I wasn't afraid to let them know who I was. And you know what? I remember standing on my desk when they were talking about evolution. Standing up on my desk and saying, Nah, not according to this book. And they look and say, What are you doing with your Bible in school? That's right, I carry my Bible in school. Because I know who I am. I'm a child of the King. Don't let the world dictate to you who they want you to be. You understand who you are in Jesus Christ. I'm a king's kid. I'm a child of God. The devils have to bow. Not to me, but to the one that's living inside of me. In my name they shall cast out devils. Get out of here, devil, in Jesus' name. Get out of here, devil, in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. 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 Second Corinthians. 518 says and all things are of God who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ and hath given to us the ministry of reconciliation to wit that God the spirit John 424 says God is a spirit to wit that God the Spirit was in Christ, the flesh, the Son, reconciling the world unto Himself. The Spirit was in the body, reaching to the world. 
saving the world. But listen to what it says. And now, or I should say, uh, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and hath com committed unto us the word. The word of reconciliation. What's the word? It's your testimony. God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself. But now he's given us the ministry of the word of reconciliation. What, he, what did he say? Amen. He said, ye shall be witnesses unto me. You're ambassadors for Christ. You have the word of your testimony. How did they overcome the devil? By the blood of the lamb and the word of their testimony. That ministry of reconciliation, that, that spirit that was in Jesus, that was saving the world is now in us as God in the body of Jesus Christ he was only in one place at one time no the spirit was everywhere but his physical representation was only the body of Jesus Christ but now his spirit is living in all of us and so there's a physical representation it's not just one but it's a whole bunch of us all throughout the city God is in us reconciling Barstow to himself God is in you with a word of reconciliation with a testimony of what God has done in your life with a testimony of how God delivered you from drugs with a testimony how God delivered you from alcohol and then it goes on to say and believe it or not, I'm getting ready to close here in a moment. Now then, we are ambassadors. What is an ambassador? An ambassador is a representative of a country. When we go across seas to meet with other uh, dignitaries, we send an ambassador to represent the United States of America, to talk with them, to counsel with them, to... Uh, have uh, some type of relationship or friendship or, or diplomacy or whatever you want to call it. We have an ambassador that represents America in a foreign land. We are ambassadors for Christ. We represent a foreign land, the new Jerusalem. We are ambassadors of his kingdom in this earth. This world is not my home. I'm an ambassador for Jesus Christ. He's given me the ministry of reconciliation. He's dependent on me to reach souls. He's dependent on me to tell somebody. He's dependent on me to tell the gospel of Jesus Christ. And I love how this goes on to say, as though God did beseech you by us. I want you to pay close attention to what the scripture is saying. Close attention. As though God did beseech you by us, we pray you in Christ's stead. Be ye reconciled to God. When I studied this out, it blew my mind. Because when he said, we pray you in Christ's stead, he was literally saying, I'm standing in the place of Christ. Be reconciled to God. You say, that sounds egotistical. No, it's scriptural. The word instead comes from that right there. In somebody else's stead. See, God was reaching the world through Jesus Christ. But now he's reaching the world through us instead. Because we are in the stead of Christ. What the God did through Jesus when he raised the, sick, uh, the dead, when he healed the sick, when he opened the blind eyes and opened the deaf ears, he said, greater things are you going to do. Why? Because the same spirit that dwelt in Jesus Christ is dwelling in us. He was doing the miracles, but now we can do the miracles instead. That's powerful. That's powerful. That's not ego. 
And that's not self-righteousness. That's understanding who we are. We are ambassadors. We have the same spirit that raised Lazarus from the dead living inside of us. When we get the revelation of who we are and what we have, oh, we will turn our city upside down. Okay, let me move on. Verse 5 and 6 says, And he gave heed unto them, expecting to receive something of them. He had expectancy. Then Peter said, I'm a Pentecostal, I'm broke. <laughs> Isn't that the way we feel sometimes? He said, I don't have any money for you, lame man. You know, the world thinks money's going to answer all their problems. A lot of times we are not able to help them with money. But he said, silver and gold I don't have. But I do have something for you that's better than silver or gold. And such as I have, give I thee. How dare we have this power in us and hold it to ourselves? How dare we have this power and anointing and not give it to someone else that is hurting? This power of the Holy Ghost that we know so well, how dare we hold it to ourselves? We've got to tell somebody so that somebody else can receive what we have received. And so he said, in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. The third thing we have to have, in case you're wanting to review, let's review. We have to know who he is. We have, actually, that'd be four things. We have to know what we have. We've got to know who we are. And we've got to understand the authority of Jesus' name. We have a name that is above every name. That at the name of Jesus every knee shall bow. In things in the heavens and things in the earth and things beneath the earth. That means the devils got to bow to Jesus. We are buried with him by baptism. In the name of Jesus Christ. We took on his name. We are bought in his name. We are baptized in his name. We have the authority of his name. He said in my name ye shall lay hands on the sick and they shall shall recover in my name you, you shall cast out devils it's in his name if the devil's pushing you around use the name on him if the devil's trying to put you in a box build a wall that you can't get through in the name of Jesus you bind that devil you pray that wall down in the name of Jesus because God has given you authority authority in the name of Jesus. Barstow and the spirits that bind this, spirit, this city are no match for you because you have the authority of His name. You have His spirit living inside of you. They're no match. Sometimes Pentecostals can be so funny. Going around like, oh, the devil. They see a devil behind every bush and every tree. And they're so afraid. Oh, the devil's been after me today. Well, why don't you turn around and cast him out in the name of Jesus Christ? Because you've got the power to do it. And the devil knows that and he trembles. The devil is afraid of us. We don't need to be afraid of him. He's afraid of us. If we ever realize who we are, what we have, the authority that we have with Jesus' name, he would tremble. And I believe he is tonight. Amen. I'm getting, I'm getting to the last points. So they knew what they had. They knew the authority of Jesus' name. And then verse 7. And he took him by the right hand. Amen. Go ahead and. Have a seat, sis, but don't play just yet. Just yet. Amen. We're going to close here shortly. Amen. They got hope now, though, because <laughs> they see you there. And he took him. 
he took him by the right hand and lifted him up. Now I want you to realize something. When Peter grabbed him by the right hand and lifted him up, there's no miracle at this point. Nothing has happened supernaturally. He grabs him by the hand and he begins to pull him up. And the Bible says, and immediately his feet and ankle bones received strength. Peter did what he could do in his humanity. Peter couldn't heal his feet and his ankle bones. But Peter could grab him by the hand and lift him up. Our responsibility is not to do the miracle. Sometimes we feel like we're responsible whether somebody gets healed or not. No, that's not our job. That's God's job. Our job is to grab the world by the hand and to pick them up. But wait a minute, they're in sin. Wait a minute, if I go in their house, there's cigarette smoke. I don't want to do a Bible study there. Hey, you might have to get cigarette smoke smell, uh, smell on your clothes to pull somebody up. But you grab them by the hand and you lift them out of that pit. You may have to go to a house where there's witchcraft and ornaments, things in the house. You may feel the spirits, but you go there in the authority of Jesus' name. You teach that Bible study. You grab them by the hand and you pick them up. When we pass by the world and we fix our eyes upon them and we say, look on us. We got something in our church that you need to have. Look at our church. Look what we got. Oh, we like that part, but we don't want to get our hands dirty when we go to pick them up out of the pit. Well, it took a little bit of a turn there, didn't it? It's the truth, though. We don't want to go... Pick them up and take them to Sunday school on the church bus when we smell all alcohol on their breath. When they're tatted up, got jewelry in every crevice of their body, and just like a pin cushion. They got metal everywhere, blue hair, spite. Oh, we don't want to touch that. We don't want that. But the Bible said he picked them up by the hand. I know you're down there. I know you're hurting. I know you need a miracle. I know you need deliverance. I have what you need. I've got Jesus. God forbid that we would not be willing to reach down and pick them up to grab hold of them. I'm not saying join in with their sin. I'm not saying do what they're doing. You grab them by the hand and you pull them up in the name of Jesus. And as you do it, God is going to give them the miracle. God is going to heal the feet and the ankle bones. He's going to give strength. Hallelujah. Don't try to do what only God can do. If they don't get their healing the first time, just keep praying. It's not, it's not your fault. It's not even God's fault. Because there's probably some lack of faith somewhere in there. But you keep praying. You keep pulling. You keep grabbing. You keep lifting. Pull them out. Amen. And then when he was healed, he was leaping up and he stood and he walked and entered with them to Apostolic Lighthouse. I know I'm changing the word tonight. That's horrible. <laughs> You're like, hey, Brother Axe, tell, don't you know the scripture? I'm just making the point. He was healed, not in the church. Why do we think that only people can get the Holy Ghost in these four walls? Why do we think God can only pour, pour, uh, perform a miracle in this altar? That same power is in your house. 
It's in your bedroom. It's in your car. It's everywhere. And so they went into the church. And now he's walking. And he's leaping. And people wonder why we shout in church. Man, if you knew where I was. If you knew the healing and the deliverance that God has given me. You would jump up and down too. You would run the aisle too. You would shout too. You would dance too. If you knew where God brought me out, you would be leaping and praising God. Now they're having church. How much better was the prayer meeting to Peter and John once they brought somebody healed with them? What a better prayer meeting than if they would have passed them up and left them at the gate beautiful. Oh, when we get to win a soul, there's no church service like a church service when you got somebody with you that's filled with the Holy Ghost and gets baptized in Jesus' name. Oh, it's easy to shout. It's easy to praise God. There's no joy like the joy of a soul winner. And every one of us, every one of us are soul winners. Amen. All right, I think we can start playing a little soft now. Okay. I preached 45 minutes. Brother Scott probably remembers this. I preached 45 minutes one time from a 3 by 5 card <laughs> with three points on it. <laughs> I spent 15 minutes per point. My wife calls it the gift of gab. I don't know if it's a gift or a curse, but I can go a long time. But I am going to close here shortly. So it's our job to take them by the hand. It's our job to lift them up. But it's God's job to do the miracle. And notice what happened. Notice what happened when the miracle was performed. Five thousand thousand souls were baptized with the Holy Ghost speaking in tongues and baptized in water in the name of Jesus Christ. Five thousand because of one. One. Miracle. You see, miracles are not so we can get all big headed, Brother Hicks, and say, oh, we had somebody get out of a wheelchair in our church. Look at us. Now, that is something we're going to talk about. Don't get me wrong, because that's exciting. But the purpose of miracles. Is not so the church can boast. But the purpose of miracles is to see thousands of souls saved. You look at the ministry of Jesus Christ. He would do a miracle. And his fame would get no a noise abroad. And they would come to him and he would sit him down and teach him. How are we going to reach our city in the short time that we have before the Lord comes back? Through the demonstration of the power of the Holy Ghost. One miracle in this church could bring a thousand soul revival. This building wouldn't even support the revival that God could do with one miracle. Now, we don't seek signs and wonders and miracles, but we seek souls. And God uses miracles to bring great revival. If you have somebody in this church come to the altar that's blind and they receive their sight, I guarantee you, there's a whole lot of people in this city are going to find out like that. And they're going to come to this church and say, I, I'd have never heard of this before. I want what you have. And people will pound these doors down 
over one miracle. But I'm here to tell you tonight, there are many, 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 many miracles that are going to take place in this church. Amen. Do you believe that? They, they, they may not believe in one God. They may argue with you about holiness and living a holy life. They may not agree with our method of baptism. But they'll never argue with the demonstration of the power of God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Let's stand. We know who He is. We've got to know what we have. We've got to know who we are. We've got to use the name and the authority of Jesus' name. And then the last thing is, God's going to give us a miracle. Not for our boasting. But because God wants to save souls. Two, three, five miracles in this church. And you'll have 100, 200 new people. Because they just want to come and check it out. You'll have Trinitarians. You'll have Buddhists. You'll have Hare Krishnas. You'll have all kinds of different religions come. Because they've never seen demonstration. We haven't. Wow, I feel such an anointing. This altar's open as we sing. I want us to just come to this altar and begin to worship God.